All right, guys, we're back again with another episode on the It's More Than Just Money Movement channel. And as you know, this is the winner's circle uh, part of the channel and where we bring you amazing people that are doing amazing things, more specifically to add value in society and to have add value to other people, more specifically young South Africans. You know, and today I've got Mr. Howard Sexton. Uh, he is the king of social media. And I said to him that my I'm planning to unseat him. I want to be <laughs> the king. So I'm going for his throne. He's a businessman and he's the chairman of the Jewish Report. He's a political activist and, and he's done a lot of work uh, in this country, uh, even during apartheid times, isn't it? Absolutely. You yeah. know, I, I arrived at university and there was a war going on. It was the 1980s. Yes. And uh, you could sit quietly and go to lectures or you could do what was right. And so I took to the streets and I spent most of the 1980s being shot at by police, being tear gassed, being chased by dogs. It was the most exhilarating, fantastic time. But freedom is a very important thing to everyone. Yeah. And just because my skin color was lighter rather than darker, didn't mean to say that I shouldn't participate. And there were many thousands of people like me. And the struggle for freedom and justice in South Africa was an integral part of my life and my history. I founded the Jewish anti-apartheid movement. And the Jewish anti-apartheid movement. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I'm very happy. Yeah, it's something I'm enormously proud of, that I've been part and parcel of the movement to peace, freedom, and democracy in South Africa since the 1980s. Yeah. Um, although sometimes people blame me for all the problems that we have, but they made some very poor decisions along the way. I just allowed them to make those decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so where did that conviction and passion come from? I can see, even when you speak, no doubt um you have passion it doesn't matter what conversation you're having about what there's a lot of passion when you talk entrepreneurship you are passionate when you talk uh, the work that you do with the jewish report you're passionate when you talk anti-apartheid struggle you are passionate where does that passion come from i think all passion comes from within mm. everyone has to find what they're passionate about you know i came out of university as a lawyer and I went to oh, go you're work, a lawyer. And I went to go work in a very corporate law firm where I'd spend my time dictating 100-page contracts. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. This is just not for me. I feel I'm making no difference in the world. You have to understand what's important to you as an individual and what's important to you is different to what's important to me. But you have to find your passion from within and you have to pursue it with great vigor. I think the thing we have to realize is, you know, our parents have great dreams and aspirations for us. And it's great and it's wise and it's correct. But ultimately, we have to make our own decisions in life. And those decisions must be what makes us happy and how do we build a life that will give us contentment and happiness. Mm -hmm. And that's part of my passion. I only try do the things that I feel absolutely passionate about. Doesn't mean to say that we don't all put up with a lot of crap in our lives and do things that we don't want to do. Yeah. But the core of what we do has to be our passion. Hmm. So you, you were an attorney and you decided to leave corporate to do what exactly at the time? So I was a com commercial attorney and I had issues with the South African army. There was compulsory military conscription. And so I had delayed by two degrees staying out of the army. I had delayed by my law articles. I'd signed my law articles a little later so I wouldn't have to go into the army. I applied then to do an MBA and they rejected me mm -hmm. from the army. I mean, uh, not the MBA. They said, you have to come into the army now. And I was faced with a choice. I was either going in to go into an apartheid army or else I was going to go to jail or I was going to leave the country. And so I opted for number three. Um, I went to America. I was lucky enough and fortunate en enough to get a scholarship to Brandeis University in Boston. I started my master's at Brandeis and I have my master's degree from Brandeis. And along the way, I met a professor from Harvard University, a world expert in international conflict resolution, and he invited me into his class. 
so my master's degrees in political advocacy and international conflict resolution, worked in Washington, D.C., came back to South Africa, which is a country I'm enormously passionate about. It's home. It will always be home. And I thought, well, how do I use these new skills that I have? Mm. And South Africa was fast moving towards a democracy. So I joined. So this was still in the 80s. This is now in the 90s. In the na- early the 90s. Early 90s. And I joined the Independent Electoral Commission. I became executive director of the Independent Electoral Commission, running parts of the 1994 election and much of the 1999 elections, giving people peace, freedom, and democracy. And I cannot explain to you the exhilaration of what it's like to wake up every morning thinking, I'm going to go change the world today. And you know something? I worked every night and every weekend for six years of my life. Hmm. 18, sometimes 20 hours a day. Over some periods, I never even left my office. I would sleep on the couch because that's how important it was to me to be able to deliver freedom to the people of South Africa. And I think we've succeeded. No one today questions whether South Africa will continue to be a democracy or not. We've embedded this culture of freedom and democracy into the nation. But that having been said, it's up to you and me and the people watching it to make the right decisions when we go to the ballot box. Yeah. And that's the problem because for many people, particularly younger people watching, they become so disillusioned with politics that they're not interested. The thing that they've realized, or maybe not everyone has realized, is government's not going to come save you will never come save you. You have to go save yourself. But you can't avoid the fact that if you do go and make some money, if you do go get a job, if you do go and buy a loaf of bread, if you do go and buy petrol, the government is going to take a big chunk of that. Yeah. More than 50% of everything that you earn is going to go in VAT payments or in import duties or in petrol taxes or in, or in PAYE. The government's going to take 50%. And the question you have to ask is, are you going to get value for that 50%? Mm. Or are you going to allow government to actually go steal that money? So when you look at the state of South African youth, black or white, I mean, whatever lens you're looking at it from, what do you think the future would be? I mean, 30 years from now. We've been 30 years in democracy, almost 30 years. And obviously there'll be another 30 years that we're going to be living as young people. When you look at the youth and the lack of skills that exist in the market, what do you think needs to be done in terms of the bridge that needs to be built to help the youth then get to the next level? Yes, you said no one is coming to save them. But what do you see? What can they correct themselves? So I want to take it back to the first time we met. Ronen Ayres' book launch. Yes. And if you remember, he has a panel of some of his staff, and Ronen was recently a guest on your show, and he talks about Generation Z and how Generation Z really wants to make such a difference to the world. And he has all these panelists talking about their ideals and their hopes and their dreams for the world. And if you remember the question that I asked that panel, Mm. I said this week, You've get, got youth in Europe who've thrown cans of tomato soup at artwork to protest about the environment. You've got youth that week, it was the midterm elections in the United States, picking up people and taking them to the polls, making sure that every single person was registered. And I posed to those panelists, so what are you doing? I'm hearing all of these great fluffy things about improving the world, a more tolerant, a better world. What are you actually doing? And the answer came back was, a tweet. Ooh. Guys. I remember that. I remember that answer. If you think that by sitting on your phone and tweeting, you're going to change the world, terribly sorry. What you've just done is you've handed the power to someone else. If you're not registered to vote, you've handed the power to the few people who did register to vote to decide on your future. And you know what that means? You're going to have no future at all. Because their future isn't important to the people who registered. They're only interested in themselves, the people who registered. Mm. But you know what the biggest argument is, um, Howie, coming from young people nowadays? Like you said, the government is not coming to save them. So their rationale is that if the government is not coming to save me, 
then I'm not going to vote at all because it's not going to help me with anything. And I've heard that from youth say to me that, why should I vote? Why should I do anything if there isn't even a system that allows me to prosper as a young black person? Nowadays? Well, why isn't there, there a system that allows them to prosper? Because they don't get off their asses and go register and go vote. They don't form political parties. They don't stand in elections. They don't actively go look after candidates. They don't get people to the polling stations. And they've handed their power to somewhere, someone else. That's their problem. Their problem is that they're not activists. The problem is they take whatever abuse they get given. And they get given a lot of abuse. You know... Pravin Gordon, when he was Minister of Finance, predicted that during the Zuma era, mm. one and a half trillion rand was stolen from South Africa. Now, whose money was that? South Africa's money, young people's money. Well, it was your grandmother's pension that wasn't paid. Yeah. It was the houses that weren't built. It was the teachers we didn't employ. That's whose money it was. They stole it from you and me and the people watching. And they're going to continue to steal it from you and me unless people do something about it. So they're right. People are disillusioned about politics. Yeah. Well, do something about it. Don't opt out. These people are taking your money. If you're lucky enough in South Africa to get a job, and very few people are, but if you're lucky enough, you're going to be paying tax. If you go to the shop and you buy a Coke, you're paying a sugar tax and you're paying VAT. If you fill up a car with petrol or go into a taxi and the taxi fare, part of it goes to pay petrol, you're paying a tax. And you either want to control that money and make sure some of that money comes back to get you a better life for yourself. Mm. Or else you say, I don't care. Not my problem. In which case, continue to be unemployed. You know, I'm very close to the community in Clipdown. It's an amazing community. I don't know if you've ever, ever been to it. Clipdown's really important in the history of South Africa because that's where the Freedom Charter was signed. The very basis of our constitution, this wording that says, we the people of South Africa, we own this constitution. And it comes from Clipdown because that's where the Freedom Charter, the original constitutional document of our nation was created. And what did government do? They went and built this massive monument in Clipdown, a four-star hotel, a beautiful square. But just across the railway tracks, the people live. And they don't have running water in their homes. They've got plastic toilets outside their homes. There's sewage running in the streets. In the streets yeah. There's no legal electricity connections. How is it possible 30 years after democracy that in Soweto, a few kilometers away from here, that there are people living in abject poverty and squalor. How is it possible that the youth of South Africa are getting probably an, an education that is no better than they received after apartheid or during apartheid? Why? Because people say, I'm disillusioned with politics. I'm not going to get involved. Mm. Well, if that's the approach, your life's going to continue on the exact same trajectory. You're going to live on your 350 rand grant that you get every month. Which doesn't even buy you a meal. Can't buy you a meal. Who can survive on it? But unless you do something about it, that's what you're going to get. And I'm going to say something as well. Yeah. Unless you do something about it, that's what you deserve. Sure. Unless you do something about it, that's what you deserve. Yeah. Because you've chosen to accept. You've chosen to accept. You've chosen to be passive. In a world where we create the platform to give every South African a voice, to allow every South African to stand for election, to allow every South African to vote in an election, to provide every South African their own future. And if you're not willing to take it, you deserve what you get. Hmm. Wouldn't one listening to you saying that say, well, I mean, I'm going to give up. I'm just going to accept well, I think that's what people have done already. They've yeah. accepted. What I'm trying to do is to say, if you're happy with your life, great, accept. If you don't think it can get any better, great, accept. So what do you think the ones that are progressive, the progressive youth that are studying businesses, that are employing other youth, and basically do want to plug into the system and help other people, what do you think are the ways, are the things that they can do on the grassroots level, to 
to spread the message and also take these people to another level when it comes to their consciousness and wanting to be part of a greater South Africa. Those of us who've been fortunate enough to have a real education mm. need to understand that we have an obligation to the other people in South Africa, but only to those people who are willing to be part of it. So if you were lucky enough to get a university degree, yeah. go and help others. Employ people, mentor people, make sure that people get an education. You know, one of the greatest cardinal sins of South Africa in its road to democracy is we didn't have free university education to people. How is it possible? It took us 20-something years after democracy before we even introduced NISFES. And even on NISFES, you have students st sleeping in libraries, unable to afford food. How is that possible if we're trying to develop our nation? that we have that. Yeah. Education is the most fundamental thing. You know, the Jewish community around the world has been relative, rel relatively successful. Yeah, of course, yeah. And you know what the secret is? Well, of course, we want to know what the Jewish secret is. Education. Our parents would starve to give us an education. That's what it took. They knew the secret to everything in life was education. Mm. No one can ever take it away from you. And it's not just a Jewish thing. I was in, in the slums of Mumbai. There's a place in Mumbai, one square kilometer big, million people called Dharavi Slum. One of the most remarkable places you've ever seen. Alex looks like luxury in comparison to Compared to, to that. Oh, yes. Mm. Spotlessly clean. You know how many police people for a million people? Zero. No police. No police. You know why? Culturally, it is so unacceptable that anyone would steal or commit a crime that it just doesn't happen. A million people, no police. Spotless. Everyone looks after their yard, their homes. Absolutely spotless. And at the end of spending a day in Daravi slum, my guide who took me through who was turning 21 the next day says, I'll take you back into the middle of Mumbai. I said, no, don't worry. Like, I feel completely safe in this environment. Drop me at the train station. Just tell me which train to, to get on and I'll find my own way. So he leaves me at the train station on a platform and I'm standing there by myself. There isn't another white face for probably 10 kilometers anywhere and six big guys wearing leather jackets head straight for me. And I think, I'm going to die. There's no doubt in my mind, like, they're coming to get me. Someone's going to have to tell my mother where to come get my body. <laughs> and they walk up to me and they say, who are you and what are you doing here and why are you in the slum and why are you alone? A thousand questions. Yeah. And then they tell me, all six of them are finishing off their accounting degrees and studying for MBAs the next year. And they live in the slum. And I say to them, once you've graduated, where will you move to? They say, we don't want to move anywhere else. This is the best place in the world. This is a real community. Everyone knows each other. Everyone cares about each other. Everyone is after the same thing. And even though they came from poverty in the slum, education they knew would give them a much better life. But they didn't want to lose the culture that they actually had as a group of people. And the train arrives and, you know, it's like you see in the images, there are people sitting on the roof, there are people hanging onto the windows, Tens of thousands of people on the train. And we walk in and they shout out, there's a foreigner, make room for him. And everyone parts. And I'm sitting on a train with 10,000 Indians. Not a, a thought in my mind that there's any criminality or any, any violence or anything. And they get off to go to their lectures a little, a little before I do. And maybe a hundred people come to say, do you know where to get off the train? Can we look after you? Can we walk you back to your hotel? How is it possible that in South Africa, people don't feel safe to walk on the streets of South Africa at night? People don't feel safe to live in their homes. The main victims of crime in South Africa are your next door neighbors, are people who live in the townships. What, where have we gone wrong? What have we failed to build? And that's the place where we're supposed to be protecting each other there. Exactly. Those are the people that need to be looking after each other. So don't the concept of Ubuntu. So I want to say, don't tell me about Ubuntu. Mm. Practice it. South Africa is a country full of noise. 
sometimes you have to listen beneath the noise to hear the music. But it's a country full of noise and we have to stop talking and rather doing. Let's never mention the word, word Ubuntu again. Let's only practice it. The actions. The actions. So, wow. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I think anyone who's listening uh, and they've got an ear, that they've got to then just tune in and hear that. Tell me about your entrepreneurial journey. Because you've done the political stuff. It's still in you, but you're also an entrepreneur. I am. Yeah. Uh, I was running elections. And after six years, I decided that was it. There was nowhere else for me to go. We had set all the electoral systems in place. Everything else after that would be repetitive. I am not one for repetition, which is maybe why I'm so bad at gym, the thought of doing the same thing every day. <laughs> over and, over and, over. <laughs> and I think it probably shows. But, but at the IEC, amongst the things I did is I looked after all the technology departments. And so, so after my second elections, my second general elections, I That's went. That's ninety nine. And so, beginning of February, last day of February twenty twenty, I uh, was my last day at the IEC. Mm. And the next day, on the first of March, I joined the technology startup business as chief operating officer called Healthbridge, links doctors and medical insurers to each other, and it was the first online transaction switch in South Africa, and I ran that for six years. And after that, started a telecommunications company, mm. uh, Sycom Voice Services, Indian Ocean Telecoms, Terrific, Red Vine, that's all kind of within the group. And so I love the space where you can build. I'm not great on every day being the repetitive thing. So give me a task, let me build something, let me set it up, and then let me hand it over to people far better than me to actually run the thing and do the small slight improvements. I'm the big picture idea. And I've been fortunate in that, in that I've tried many things. Some, some of them have failed because you can't be an entrepreneur without, without failure. Uh, you know, we built a terrific uh, business, which we call Terrific, which was going to tell people how to save money on their cell phone contracts. The best technology you've ever seen. Spent millions and millions of rands on it. Everyone loved it. No one wanted to buy it. Nobody wanted to buy it. We, we, could, we, we did surveys. We spe spent half a million rand on advertising. People could come for free and we could show you, you could spare, save about 250 rand, 240 rand a month on your cell phone bill. But if we charged you 99 rand for it, you weren't willing to spend 99 rand to save two and a half thousand rand or 3,000 rand a year. At 49 rand, we tried it again. No one was willing to spend 49 rand to save 3,000 rand a year. At 1999, I think we sold one or two. Everyone was happy with it for, it for it to be a free contract, a free free product, but no one was willing to build it. It was a, a, a buy it. It was a lesson that we learned. What year was it? 1999? Uh, no, no, no. This is, this is probably going back five, six years. Five, six years from today. Yeah. It's 2017. Yeah. yeah. So, so we thought we had a fantastic product. The business failed. Same way we built a, built a business to try help parents control what their kids would do on their cell phones. Everyone loved it. No one bought it. We built a business that was for call centers that would do dashboards for call centers. Everyone loved it. No one bought it. So you have to, as part of the journey, be able to fail. And we've failed multiple times, but we've also been successful in what we've built. How expensive is the failure, though? You know something? Yeah. Of course, it costs you money, but it rewards you in education. The next time, you do something a little different. Learned many lessons from failure, but I've also learned lessons from success. Mm -hmm. And part of the success is because I learned from all the failures. So our, our previous guest said, when you want to raise funding, you shouldn't ask for a little money. You must ask for big money. Right. So basically saying build big ideas that require you to attract a lot of money. What's, what's your take on that? You know, they say if you owe the bank a million rand, you've got a big problem. If you owe the bank a billion rand, the bank's got a big problem. I must tell you, I'm not sure I agree with your previous guest on that. Asking someone for their money 
is a sacred thing that you do. If I come to you and say, fund my business, I have to be pretty sure because it's your money. If you're entrusting it to me, I should be bloody sure that I'm going to be successful that, with that. So if I would take your money and fail and you would lose your money, and the same applies to the bank. If the bank loses money, it's not the bank's money, it's you as a depositor in the bank that's losing your money. So we've never gone out and asked people for money. We've done some interesting things in the business, like I'm going to work for the next two years free of charge. What are you going to contribute? going to contribute a bit of money you're going to contribute some of your staffing you're going to contribute some of your marketing i'm going to contribute my time for the next few years free of charge because i back myself and so that's part of my contribution that i'm putting in mm. so i've never gone to a bank and asked for money and i hope never to go to a bank to ask for money mm. or to an invest and what am I going to spend that money on and how am I going to spend it? We were talking a little earlier about your guest saying, you know, she used to cry, cry in her Porsche. In a Porsche. And then and uh, after she lost money, she cried in her Taz. <laughs> yeah. Why did she have a Porsche? Whose money was that? Was it her investor's money? Was it her money? Why didn't she take an Uber? Why didn't she have a tears in the beginning? It could have got her from point B to A to point B. Why didn't she spend that money in building her business? And there's a generational thing here. If you go to the older generation, my parents' and grandparents' generation, the people who were billionaires, you had no idea. They drove second-hand Toyotas, and they drove them for 20 years, and they didn't have bling earrings, and no one knew that they were rich, but they built empires. Yeah, we were just speaking now earlier about one of South Africa's billionaires that recently passed. Uh, and, and I said to you, he managed to keep a very low profile, although he had been a billionaire all these years. So can I say, and let's mention the name, because just before recording, I went to the funeral of Eric Ellerin. Mm -hmm. And a remarkable individual died on Monday, 90 years old. And Eric Ellerin, for 74 years of his life, went to work every single day. The mere fact that he may have had billions or tens of billions was actually relevant in his life. He was building, he built the Ellerin's furniture empire. They were opening at some point in time two stores per week around the country. He would be the first one at work and the last one to leave every single day. That's what it took to build empires. He wasn't interested in the fancy cars. He had a great laugh. Of course, he did. But it was never about the money. It, it, it was more than just money. It, it, money is irrelevant. I've never met anyone who was happy because they had a pile of money. I've met people who were happy because they could do good things with their money. Mm. Sometimes they bought a yacht. Sometimes they bought a home. But the thing that we know from the world experts on happiness, you go buy yourself a new car, you're going to be incredibly happy. Your level of happiness is like this. Buy yourself a car, your level of happiness goes up. But 52 days later, your level of happiness is exactly the same as it was before you bought the car. Physical things don't bring you happiness. The things that bring you happiness are life experiences. Go out for a remarkable meal. Go on holiday. Do something unique you've never done before and tell everyone about it. And according to Daniel Gilbert, the world expert on happiness, professor at Harvard, the only thing that brings you lasting happiness is never the car, the diamond ring, the bling. It's the life experience and your level of happiness goes up for a period of two years if you buy yourself a life experience. So save up some money. Go on holiday to the south of France. Go run with the bulls in Pamplona in Spain. Do something unique that no one else has, has done. And that's been, to be quite honest, part of my secret of happiness. 78 countries later. The thing that I know that brings me happiness is to go to places that no one I know has ever been to before. To not stay in five-star hotels, but to meet locals in places like Nepal and Vietnam and Cambodia and the Philippines and in South America, in Mexico, in, uh, in Peru and Bolivia. 
to experience life and taste cultures and meet different people and taste the foods of the different people and experience their music and soak up a world that's out there. And that I know brings me great happiness, but what brings me happiness is not the same that brings you happiness. Every person's completely different. But for me, I want to understand the world. One of our things, are, I think our great disadvantage that we have as South Africans is we don't have exposure. Mm. People get born in South Africa, never leave South Africa, don't understand the world. We think this is the world. So the, South Africa is actually very unique. When you do travel and you go overseas, the first thing that strikes you is if you went to Tel Aviv today, even though in the middle of a war, at 4 a.m., women are walking by themselves on the streets of Tel Aviv feeling completely safe. South Africans have never experienced that. So they don't understand that's actually the norm. That's what we need to aspire to. So our problem is we understand the world from a very small little perspective. Politically in South Africa, who do we identify with? We identify with Cuba and Venezuela and Russia. These are all failed states. Those are our role models as a country. They're the pariahs of the world. And South Africa is fast becoming a pariah as well. Why? Because our government and our leaders and our cabinet ministers don't have exposure. They don't understand the world. They don't understand what it takes to be an entrepreneur. But they travel to Dubai. They, they go to, to Dubai, you know, you know see what? how beautiful it is, come back, change nothing in South Africa. Well, they go to Dubai because apparently that's where you can deposit the money you've stolen because their banking system allows for it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the Guptas are in Dubai? Yeah. It's a great place to put your stolen money. But why can't it be a great place to learn ideas and come back and implement while continuing to steal the money if that's what you want to do? You're doing it anyway. But where are the successful countries? Singapore, Dubai, yeah. Rwanda. Even if you look at how Kenya has developed, the examples in our own continent of where we started comparative to them and yes. how they've overtaken us. And why aren't we learning? That's, that's my question. Why, why aren't we? Because many of those countries have rulers and governments that believe in the future of their nations, that invest in the future of their nations, whose job isn't to steal as much money as possible. Yeah. And There's so they, a shared vision for the country. Exactly. What is South Africa's vision? I don't know. I, I did see our president trying to steal the Rugby World Cup away from Sia Galisi and take credit for the rugby team. I don't know if he'd ever been to a rugby game before that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah. we have to sit down and say that very question that you asked. What is our vision? What do we want to be? Do we want to be the Singapore of Africa or do we want to be the Venezuela of Africa? Because the decisions that we make are very different depending on the future we want for the country. So a friend of mine said something that broke my heart. Successful guy owns an insurance company. We're sitting on the table. He says to me, witness, I'm not going to save black people. I'm just going to save myself. Because it doesn't matter what you do. There's no shared vision. You end up being the enemy for trying to help. And I see that even in our, our leaders to say, there isn't anyone that's saying, let's build a common vision. But not just the vision that's about moving on as a country willy-nilly, but a vision that's about moving everyone to the next level. So therefore, no one is participating in actually making sure that the country moves forward because there's no vision. And the guy is saying, I've built a successful life for myself. I'm tired of trying to help. I'm remo removing myself from all this. If all of this fails, I'm moving overseas. Well, How many people do you know that, that feel that way? So, you know something? I had a birthday party. Well, he's black. So he said he's tired of black people. So obviously you Jewish. <sighs> you're probably going to say I'm tired of the country. <laughs> so the story I was going to tell you is in January, two months before COVID began, I had a birthday party. Had a dinner at my home invited 145 people. And three years later, I thought, okay, let me go back to the list. And I want to see how many of those people I would re -back, invite back 
for dinner, how many of them made an effort? How many kept up contact during COVID? And I look at the list of 145 people and 32 of them have immigrated in three years. You know why? Skilled people. Skilled, skilled, great entrepreneurs. And you know why? They just got hutful. They tried and they tried and they said, you know something? No, not a single one of them wanted to leave. But not a single one of them believed that they could make a difference by staying. And you know something, when I look at that list, there were black people and there were Indian people. They weren't just white people. If you're a nurse in South Africa, your skills are wanted all over the world. If you're a doctor in South Africa, Ireland's trying to recruit you. If you're an entrepreneur, the Australians will have you, the Americans will have you, the Canadians will have you, the Portuguese will have you. Everyone wants you if you're an entrepreneur. And if you don't think that government is going to be there to support you, if you feel that, in fact, you're heading on a one-way track, you say, you know something, I've given up. I'm hurtful. Let me rather go somewhere else. The country owes you something. The country owes you a vision of a better future for you and your children and your grandchildren. And if you don't believe tomorrow is going to be better, then you pack up and leave if you can. And the people who don't leave are the people who can't. And that creates you into a death cycle in the country, not a virtue cycle. Because the great entrepreneurs today who built some of the biggest com companies in the country mm -hmm. are sitting in Australia and Israel and the UK and America and Canada. That's where South Africa entrepreneurs are today. Yeah. The Nati Cashes of this world. Yeah. When you think what Nati Cash has done, and it's not just in business. If you're in Swaziland, something like 80% of the population in Swaziland has received a micro loan from the Kershers. Mm. And the money paid back, Nati has now said, I don't want. That could have been done here in South Africa. Nati said, I don't want the money back. Keep funding businesses with this cash in Swaziland. What? During the people, uh, during the time of COVID, Nati Kirsch gave hundreds and hundreds of millions of rands to the people of South Africa. Set up the Sia Khaleesi Foundation, funded it so Sia could go feed people. That's all Kirsch money. And today Nati's in... New York and in the south Tel of France and Tel Aviv and yeah. London and Swaziland is not here. And why is he not here? Because that's that's the those that's those are the people who build businesses in this country. Why is Brian Joffe not here anymore? Why is Stephen Kossoff not here anymore? Where are these people? Why did they feel that there was no future for themselves in South Africa? I thought I was going to interview Brian Brian Joffe. No, well, go to Tel Aviv and you can. Yeah, we'll organize that. But the truth is, because over and over again, it becomes more and more difficult to operate an environment where you have a hostile government. You know, um, last week, government introduced national health insurance into the National Assembly, into the National Council of Provinces. Mm -hmm. Business had negotiated for months and months of months saying, this is the final straw. If for many people who are entrepreneurs and business people, if they can't be guaranteed proper health care in South Africa, they will leave. And after months and months of negotiation, you know how many amendments government made to the legislation that they introduced? Zero. They never listened at all. I sat with the Treasurer General of the ANC a few months ago, a month and a half ago, where she told me that she believed that public health care was better than private health care in South Africa. Public health care is better than private health care health, health care? In South Africa. That's what she told me. Okay. Has she but ever wait, been public hospitals are better than private hospitals? That's what she told me. That's what she believed. In which country? I I sat there absolutely astounded. My mother was a nurse for 34 years at Tembisa Hospital. There's a public, uh, Timsa Hospital is obviously a public hospital. Yeah. Right opposite, there's a private hospital. He can tell you he grew up there himself. There's no way Timsa Hospital is better than that Landmed Hospital right opposite it. You know, Not you, a go, chance. you go to Helen Joseph today, there's no running water. People are lying for weeks in bed, don't know when they're going to be operated on. 
There's no management. And she genuinely believes that somehow, if, if, for example, your mother needs medicine and she has to go every month to go collect her medicine, she has to take, if she's lucky enough to work, she has to take off a day's work for, to sit for an entire day entire at the day. hospital to pick up her medicine. And by the way, black people suffer the most with that. Day. Of course. Yeah. I met a fantastic young black entrepreneur who saw this because he saw his family members having to sit for an entire day at hospital waiting to get their monthly meds. And he came up with a brilliant idea. Little cubicles. And they would say to you, they'd send your mother an SMS, your medicine's waiting to, for you in cubicle number 68. It's available for these three days. This is the code to open it up in order to get the medicine. Who have saved people who are working 12 days of their leave a year because they wouldn't have to go sit at the hospital waiting. Mm -hmm. Think anyone was interested? Was, was it rejected? There was no bribe available, so no one was interested. Huh. So the question is, once again, do we want our country to be Venezuela or do we want it to be Singapore? Do we want it to be Rwanda? Or do we want it to be Zimbabwe? Of course we want it to be like Rwanda. Then we need and to make... Why, and why is Rwanda now leading us? That breaks my heart, actually. You know why? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't like Paul Kagame, but the man's got vision for his country. That's, what, that's the word, vision. You know, I, in, in one of the most remarkable moments of my life, I was sitting in a room with Paul Kagame in the seat in front of me, and Bill Clinton got up. And he said, here in the presence of President Kagame, I want to apologize. The Rwandan genocide happened on my watch. I did nothing to stop it. We only ever discussed it once in the, the Oval Office. We didn't think it was important enough to get involved. And he said, a million people died because of me. He said, that will always be the shame that I have and the blot upon my presidency. And in the presence of President Kagame, I want to apologize. He should never forgive me for what I did. It was a beautiful moment, remarkable moment. Kagame sat absolutely motionless in front of me. But Kagame was never a victim. Kagame went and he built the country. The massacres in Rwanda that were taking place happened the same week that we went to elections in 1994 in South Africa. It was the exact same time. Yeah, the genocide, yeah. The genocide. And he went not as a victim. He went as a leader to rebuild that country far better than it ever was before. Who's going to be our visionary? Could be you, could be the people watching. But we need a great visionary who has a vision for this country that says we deserve better than what we currently have. And what are we going to do about it? So since elections are coming up, are you saying you don't believe with believe in any of the candidates that are raising their hands to be president? No, I actually do. Um, I, but you don't have to believe in my candidate, my candidate and who I spend many I, days. I don't, I don't believe in politicians. Uh, but that's fine. But you too can be a politician. But you can't do nothing. Mm. That's the important thing. So if you think that Cyril's going to deliver you a better life in the unlikely event that you believe that Cyril is going to deliver you a better life, then go and vote for him. Or ask him for his couch, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love his couch more than anything. <laughs> you, know, that's the, you know, the sheriff the sheriff of the court arrived at the ANC offices to because they've had this 150 million rand judgment for election posters that they never paid for. And I tweeted out, like, don't take the couches. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't take the couches. Uh, but, you know, if you believe he can deliver you the future that you deserve, then go vote for him. If you think Julius can do that and if you like like that brand of radical populism and you think that somehow rather than noise he can deliver you something con 
Creek, go vote for him. But they're not the only alternative. I personally can't vote for the DA because I think they're a whites only party and they don't represent my vision of South Africa. Their top 10 leadership, what, seven are white? Uh, it's not a South Africa that I can subscribe and believe in. They've chased away all of their black leaders. But there are other people out there. There's Musi Maimani, who I spent many days a week trying to help in his election campaign, a gr man of great vision and great integrity who really wants the best for South Africa. But if you don't like him, there's Songeza Zibi and Razam Zanzi. And if you don't like Songeza, there's Colleen Makobele. And if you don't like Colleen, there's Herman Mashaba. There's a slew of people, and it could also be you or the people watching who could stand up and say, we deserve better. And that's what we actually should be saying. We deserve better than what we've got. When you do polling, when you do research, what's the thing that South Africans fear most? It's crime. They're just surviving. It's mm. not even crime. Not even crime. They're just surviving. At the end of the money, there's still more month. No mm. one's thriving in this country. People are worried about feeding their children. People are worried about can they make it to the end of the month? Can they make the repayment on the cars or the school fees? That's what people are, are worried about every single month. That's not a way to live. You know, going back to the story of Daniel Gilbert, the world expert of happiness, he asked the question, does money bring you happiness? And the answer is no. But the lack of money brings you misery. In South Africa, everyone's living in misery. We don't meet the minimum threshold to be able to have money not being a factor in every decision we make in our lives. We're worried about food on the table. We're worried about the education for our kids. We're worried about whether we can pay rent at the end of the month. We're worried about the car payment. We're always worried. You can't thrive as a nation if you're worried about the basics. Mm. We need to move everyone in the country up. And how do we do it? Number one, we stop stealing the money. We actually deliver services to people and we say there's one answer to South Africa, education, education, education. We want the best educated people on the continent. We want the best educated people in the Southern Hemisphere. It makes no difference that every year we adjust the metric results and make it a little easier so that the pass rate goes up. Because when people like Taddy Bletcher at Cedar University and Maharishi Institute, when they actually go and test students who pass metric in English, maths and science, in comparison to the rest of the world, they're on grade eight and grade nine. Yeah. So how do we go and compete the rate with, of 34%. Yeah. But how do we go compete with China when our matriculants have grade 8 maths, even though they've passed matric maths, and China's have got grade 12 plus? How do we compete with them? The answer is we don't. We can't. We have to fix our problems. So if there was a young person sitting at home listening to you and they're saying, okay, I hear you, should go out and vote and make a difference. But give me something that I can wake up on Monday morning or tomorrow morning and start doing. What can I do? I hear you and I want to take what you're saying and I want to change my life. I want to save myself. Like you said, what should I be doing? I don't have a job and I don't have the skills because I got grade eight as metric. Or I don't even have the grade eight metric. I've got nothing. Because the education system has been so bad and was unable to teach me. What can I do tomorrow morning? You know, the amazing thing of technology is it changed our lives. And the one thing we learned is you don't have to be in a classroom to learn. All you need is an internet connection. The Khan Academy online will teach you anything you want. You can go and do Harvard and MRT courses online. They're all available to you free of charge. There's no one who's sitting at home who can't go and get an education. And if you've got time, time is the most valuable thing in the world. If you've got time because you're lucky enough to be unemployed, you use that time to make yourself better, to skill yourself up. Did you just say if you're lucky enough to be unemployed? Let's think of some of our negatives as great assets. The asset of time is an amazing gift. I love that. 
if you are lucky enough to be unemployed. So it simply means you've got no excuse. But no excuse you've got more you, time than us who are busy. Exactly. Use that time to skill yourself up. Learn a skill. Go learn about AI. Learn how to program free of charge online. And we need to stop thinking that someone's going to come give me a job. No one's ever going to come give you a job. Yeah. Become a nail technician. Learn how to do it. Become a hairdresser. Become a massage therapist. You know, in in uh, in places like Indonesia, the traffic is so bad, no one wants to go anywhere. So if you need a haircut, you have an app. It's called Gojek, and you order someone to come to your home to come and give you a haircut because you can't go out in the traffic. It will take hours. So they arrive on a little motorbike. They come get. They've got a business. They got a proper business. The massage therapist got a problem. Proper business. You try to go for a massage in Johannesburg, 600 rand, 800 rand, 1,000 rand. But you know something? If it was 200 rand because someone skilled themselves up, I would have a massage every week. Mm. Mm. I'd have a haircut and a shave every week. If someone was unemployed, taught themselves how to do something and started their own business, a business in a box. If they went to hustle on the streets and sell cold drinks on the street corner and made a little profit on the first day and a big profit on the next day. You know, Gigi Alcock, I don't know if you've met. Gigi Alcock, I know Gigi, yeah. Gigi Alcock, one of the most remarkable South Africans. It's an amazing story. His family take their little white boys and they move them into rural KwaZulu-Natal. And he grows up in a mud hut in KwaZulu-Natal. No electricity, no running water. They go and they bath in the river every day. And at the end of school, he comes to Joburg because he's a migrant laborer. He presumes everyone is a migrant laborer after school because see, that's what little Zulu boys do when they finish matric. They come up to Joburg. And he realizes there's this whole world, this whole economy that exists that no one understands. And he tells the story that there's this lady who sits outside a school and according to Stats SA, she's unemployed. Yeah. But she sells 3,000 fat cook for uh, one rand. And she's taking every day. four kids to university. Four kids to university, building a double story home, but she's unemployed. Yeah. And that's the lesson for South Africa. The person sitting at home, decide what your hustle is going to be. Actually go and create your own business. You don't want APSA or NetBank or Standard Bank to give you a job on the call center. Number one in five, ten years' time with artificial intelligence. Your be call, no call there's no left. call centers anymore. It's a <laughs> even now, it's all outsourced, isn't it? It's, a, it's even they use Indians. <laughs> so no, some of the companies, some of the companies are outsourcing their their call center services to other countries. I had uh, dinner a few months ago with the head of Google Financial Services, who is here from America, mm. and I I say to him, like, what financial services does Google do? He says, well, actually, we go into banks and to telephone companies and we replace all their call center agents with an artificial intelligence robot. He says, we took over a 4,000 seat call center. We've run it for a year. And in one year, not a single person has picked up that they're speaking to a robot. Not a person. Not a single person. A 4, in a 4,000 seat call, call center. center for a year and 80% of the problems have been solved by the artificial intelligent robot. And if the robot can't do it, it says, hold on, let me transfer you to a supervisor and 20% of the calls actually get to speak to a human. So we know the days of call centers are actually over. You don't want a job in a call center because ultimately you're going nowhere. So, so in the era of artificial intelligence, technology, and everything else that you've just described, what is the role of emotional intelligence? in society you know artificial intelligence for most things will help people in their jobs rather than destroy their jobs now that applies to to not everything the very manual unskilled job is in jeopardy the yeah. lawyer who turns out the same contract over and over again is in jeopardy but what you do want is you want your doctor together with artificial intelligence to be jointly treating you you want the compassion and the humanity in the person aided and enhanced by the great benefits that artificial intelligence can give you. So, for example, they've gone back and they've 
given the the artificial intelligence computers uh scans pe- people's heart you know the ecg scans mm. and according to the doctors all these ecg scans were okay but this person had a heart attack 10 years later and that person had a heart attack 12 years later so they have the data and they give it to the artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence says this person's in danger of a heart attack and the doctor say how does it know it's a perfect ecg but the artificial intelligence can pick it up and they're not quite sure why so i want my cardiologist mm-hmm. i want him because he can speak to me and give me advice and and tell me what's happening but i want him to use the artificial intelligence because it knows more than he does so i need that to aid him rather than to replace him to be a better doctor to be a better lawyer to be better at everything that that we doing and that's one of the great benefits that we have humans understand emotion and compassion in the way that we will never let machines actually understand us and be able to react to us otherwise your girlfriend would probably be a robot and mm. for people in japan that's a viable option for you it's probably not you want that emotional connection and you want to be able to trust and we trust humans we don't trust things we never trust the computer but you do trust someone who can show you love mm. and so we're not going to be replaced we're going to be enhanced by things like like artificial intelligence so what is the future of africa looking at those things what what do you think not not now, now i'm not even speaking south africa I'm speaking the future of Africa as a whole with what you've described what does it look like to you so you know to to ask the question what does the future of Africa looks like is to ask the question what does the future of Europe look like well we know that Europe looked one way and then Russia attacked Ukraine and looked very different but the rest of Europe looks different to that just because we're in a continent doesn't mean to sh- to that we share a common destiny. So mm. we've already seen for example that there are parts of Africa that are thriving. We've spoken about Kenya, spoke about Rwanda, even places like Zimbabwe have done done relatively well. Nigeria has progressed but got a long way to go. And there are parts of Africa that are are actually deteriorating terribly. We're still having military coups in many places in Africa. We're still having human rights abuses, uh, violations in many places of Africa. So Let's not think of Africa as one place. The Americans think we're all live in one big country called Africa. But the future of South Africa looks very different to the future of Mozambique. Mozambique for example has to stop an Islamic insurgency in the north. Why? It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got to do with the fact that there's oil and gas off the coast of Mozambique. It's an attempt to gain resources and control of a lot of money. And so Mozambique has to actually solve it otherwise the country becomes chaos because it's a fight for those resources. Angola, look what happened with corruption in Angola the moment they discovered oil. Angola suddenly corruption skyrocketed very different to across the border to Botswana who discovered diamonds but had a very stable systematic non-corrupt system. Yeah. Is strong the, leadership strong as well. Strong leadership. Look at Zambia at the moment. Proper strong leader, really trying to make a difference. What is the future of Africa looks like? It's going to look like those countries with good leaders going to prosper and develop. Those countries with bad leadership and corruption going to deteriorate. We have some important choices to make. Mm. Powerful stuff. How are you? I love this conversation. Thank you so much for for making time. And yeah, and and may may our country experience more people like you. You know, people that want to see the youth prosper, people that want to see businesses thriving, people that want to see better governments, better governance, better leadership. We need that. Without that there's no country. Can I leave you with maybe my favorite thought that I heard years ago I have no idea who it's attributed to. Yeah. They said the poor do not sleep because they're hungry. The rich do not sleep because the poor are awake. We need to make sure that everyone sleeps in South Africa.
Hmm. Can you say that again? The poor do not sleep because they're hungry. The rich do not sleep because the poor are awake. Hmm. Let's make sure we all sleep. Need to find a balance. Break it down a bit before you go. We're all in this together. There's no winners or losers. We have to prosper as a nation all together. If we leave people behind, we're all doomed. We're all in this together. We need a better South Africa for all of us. And for the nation to prosper, every single individual in the nation must prosper. Absolutely. Must have prosperous citizens. And opportunities. The greatest thing that people need is opportunities. And then it's up to them whether they take that or not. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. this conversation. All right, guys. If there's a part of this conversation that you resonate with, I see everyone in our team just came from wherever they were sitting just to sit here and become an audience in this conversation. But I guess we have a wider audience online. And if there's any part of this conversation that you resonate with, please comment. Let us know what your thoughts are. Let us know what you think the future of South Africa is. You know, let us know what you think the solutions should be. And let us all work together to make this country a prosperous country. Black, white, Indian, colored, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, whatever it is. We're all in this together, like he said. We've got to make sure that this country becomes one of the best countries we can all live in. And from myself and my team broadcasting from Johannesburg, South Africa, it's more than just money. See you in the next episode. Remember to register to vote. If you don't vote and you don't love your life, you deserve it. Ciao, ciao. Are you happy? <laughs>